Hi, it's Gadget UK here again with another MVS. Um, you saw this in a previous video. Someone had removed the uh, ROM chip from here. Well, the socket, I'm assuming, because they all seem to have sockets, these boards. Um, this one might not have done, I don't know. I can't understand why you would salvage a socket off a board like this. A socket costs, what, 50p a pound or something for a good quality one. It's crazy, uh, and they did a lot of damage. Now, I cleaned up around here in the previous video on both sides. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, it's a bit cleaner. All the flux has been removed. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, draw some diagrams. I've got um, a thing here printed off for the bottom side, and one, and one for the top side here. Uh, and I'm just going to make a note of where pads are missing and things like that. And what I'm probably going to do is use a uh, turn pin, actually, because you can uh, see uh, the, you know, you can get access to the underneath of the pin to solder little wires and things to on the top side if you need to. Uh, and here's a good example of where we will need to. Can you see this black line here? There's a trace, someone ripped a trace right off that goes all the way around here to the CPU. Um, so we don't even know what state this board's in until we get uh, a ROM on there. What I do know, you can see I've got some flux here, I'm just about to clean up here. I borrowed the, well, stole the SM1 off this in the last video to get uh, the other board up and running. So we do know we're going to get a Z80 error, but I'm just more interested to see, what, once we've got a ROM on here, what happens? Do we get a watchdog? I'll then get the diagnostics ROM on and see what happens. Maybe we've got a, a RAM fault somewhere, that's perhaps what's wrong. It's most probable, unless it's been over voltaged. Uh, but, you know, one of these chips could have failed, uh, one of the custom chips. Um, We'll just see. So I guess it would be useful for you to see what happens when you've not got a ROM. Uh, we get the watchdog, and I'll just turn the speaker up, uh, the volume, just bear with me. Can you hear that clicking? Yeah, that's the watchdog. Uh, so you'll get random garbage. Uh, and that, this is happening because the CPU can't boot. Now, just coming back to the whole watchdog uh, thing again, in case you're not aware. Lots of safety critical systems have watchdog systems, in particular, you know, sort of avionics, aircraft, uh, you know, systems and things. Uh, helicopters and planes and things like that. You'll always have watchdogs um, in various parts, well, all parts of the system there, as well as, like, redundancy, you know. Uh, that, that's like multiple... Uh, you know, fault tolerance systems where you've got multiple uh, MCUs and multiple processor boards and things like that. And you'll always have, those those systems are always protected by a watchdog circuit. Um, and arcade boards use that same technology for similar reasons. Obviously it's not safety critical, but it is in terms of keeping the machine, the arcade machine, up and running as much as possible. So say for example you get a bug in some code, it could be one instruction where a program has written you know, a, a line of code there, and it's not thought about a specific condition happening where some other things, you know, all happen at the same time and it causes a crash. And when a processor crashes, you get stuck in a loop or it just locks up, etc. So when you get a lock up or a crash like that, um, in terms of an arcade machine, you want the system to be able to deal with that. The last thing you want is, uh, you know, something like this happening where it's just sat there with some garbage or a frozen screen or something and uh, you know people are not able to use the machine because you're losing money so you've got the watchdog circuit so typically you'll have a timer somewhere that starts at a predefined amount and it counts down every cycle it will go down it decrements until it gets to zero and if it gets to zero it resets the system and that's what we're seeing here that click 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 is reset 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 we're getting loads of resets because that watchdog timer, you know, starting let's say at a predetermined amount, and it's gone down over so many CP, I mean, so many cycles there, and it reaches zero, it does the reset. And the idea is that what you do within your main code on the CPU is you write to a specific uh, location in the address map, if you like, a specific value to uh, you know keep the watchdog happy to go. Yeah, I'm still working. I'm you know I'm processing, I'm processing away. I'm still running. Everything's okay. And then the watchdog accepts that and resets the timer and then starts to count down again. So, you know, you've got to frequently um, keep up, keep resetting the watchdog timer in order to stop the watchdog resetting the system. So, yeah, that's why you get the clicking. If you get an MVS and you're getting clicking like that, it's not booting code. So, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a problem with your ROM, it could be your work RAM. It could be uh, all sorts of things. You could have a problem with the data bit somewhere on the CPU, something dragging the data bit down. Uh, a bad connection between the 68k and the ROM or the RAM, etc. 
So I figured while we're here, why not have a, a bit of a clean up around this area here. I'll uh, remove the excess, you know, the solder there from where I remove the SM1 in a minute. Just clean up those pads just gently here. Because some of these are going to get snagged if we're not careful. And we'll just inspect, see what the uh, verdict is, I guess, on the damage here. Because it doesn't look as bad as first thought, actually. It might just be that one trace and maybe a couple of the pads are not great. But it just depends on where the brakes are. Yeah, there's little bits of solder in between the connections there that have come free there. I mean, obviously, without uh, a BIOS like this, it's just going to watchdog because it's got nothing to boot. You know, there's no code going to be able to run on it as it is. I'll put you on a macro in a sec just so you can see what that's like, uh, and then we'll do the same thing on the underside. Yeah, there we go. So you can see clearly the uh, trace that was ripped up there. Uh, again, like I said, it's crazy. Uh, why didn't they just snip it when it when they realised it was coming off? Um, so yeah, we've got a missing pad there. There's a little bit of it. It might make a connection to there. So these are things I'm going to have to make. I would have to make a note of. Look at the damage here. So we need to inspect those there. Um, yeah, got a pad missing here. Does it go anywhere? Is it supposed to go there? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Um, so for the most part, that's that top side there, that's not too bad actually, it's just going to be one or two wires, totally fixable. So a quick look on the inside for cleaning up, you can see we've got a few pads missing here. Um, look at that, some solder on the edge of there, and I think the pad's missing. Uh, it's not too bad on the underside. So apologies if you've seen this a million times, you probably have on my channel, I've covered it so often. Uh, just going to use some desolder braid uh, and flux here uh, and just gently drag over these uh, pads here to absorb the solder. This flux is awful. Uh, I might do a comparison video actually on different fluxes. Uh, that chip quick flux is much better with things like this where you want to, this braid to absorb the solder. It really acts as like a wicking uh, agent whereas this solder, uh, sorry this flux, uh, it works but you've got to give it longer more heat more time uh, and obviously the less heat the better with something like this so yeah i would uh, recommend chip quick over this cheap uh, fake amtec flux any day although this uh, amtec flux i'm using is okay for separating things you know it works quite well when you're trying to do soldering um, pins don't join together and things like that so yeah i guess there's pros and cons but having said that the chip quick flux uh, does a, a remarkable job at that aspect of it as well But the plan here is just to clean this area up, uh, just so it's presentable. And if at some point I work out what uh, EEPROM I could uh, replace the uh, original master on here with, I'm hoping there's something suitable, then we might be able to get this board 100% up and running as well. Uh, and you may wonder, even if we can't, there's still mileage in trying to understand what's wrong with this board. Because if you don't know what's wrong with it, you can't really use it as a, a decent set of spares, can you? You just you'll just end up taking chips off on off on off on, wondering what on earth's going on. It's uh, it's always a good idea, even with spare boards or boards you know that you've designated as for spares, to understand what is actually wrong with them. If you don't know where the fault is, I mean it's a it's a strange one really because once you know where the fault is, you can then fix it. So, it, but you know, in my mind, um, I want to know what's wrong with the board personally um, you learn a lot even if you can't fix it if you understand what is wrong with it you can uh, at least then uh, have some confidence in the, the, the other parts on there perhaps uh, unless it's been over voltage in which case lots of things could be faulty with it but more often than not that doesn't happen more often than not something shorts as a result of the over voltage and uh, saves everything else We'll just mop up uh, that stuff first of all, it absorbs pretty easily actually without any IPA at this stage and then we'll get some IPA on and I'll uh, clean all around that area. So there we go, I've cleaned around that general area, you can see that's looking super tidy. I'm just going to draw them up now on here uh, so I, I know exactly what state these are in on this top side uh, and then we'll have a go at sticking uh, like I say a turn pin socket on there and uh, patching some links and things. The, the trace it's detached from the pad so I've just uh, followed it around here 
and it goes to pin 47 so 44 45 46 47 on the 68,000 there uh, and you can see it's marked 44 in the corner there hopefully you can see that and the, you know there's little notches to indicate uh, batches of five I think so you can work out pretty easily where the uh, the pin the, the pin number uh, and if we just go to that trace and I wobble around there I can't find the damn thing now it's hard at this distance yeah can you hear that we've got a short there to 44 so uh, and then I'm just reflecting that on my diagram here so I need to know I know that I need to put a wire here from to the 68k on pin 47 uh, and I'll just continue working my way around there's only going to be three or four I think on the top so what's happened down here is uh, scary I've had to use the uh, fiberglass pen to expose some of this but can you see it's like there's been a gouge and it's bent the traces it's pushed the trace down and into each other so there's some shorts and things around here so I'm going to need to continue with the fiberglass pen there just to expose a bit more of the you remove some of this the solder mask uh, off, uh, silk screen rather off uh, here so that I can see it a bit clearer and then I'm going to have to do connectivity tests on all of these traces here and work out make sure none of them are showing because as you can see down here these look like they're actually all short into a degree yeah so the damage done here is is pretty scary actually there is a gouge through five or six or seven traces there and it's pushing some of them into each other others have got gaps etc so uh, I've tried to separate them as, uh, with a, a probe you know I've got the tip of the probe in between separate them so ultimately we've got a break of about six or seven traces there I'm going to go over this now with some flux and disol uh, desolder braid just drag it over to get a bit of solder on there so that I can see a bit more clearly and the solder may break bridge one or two of them but I then need to make sure that none of these are actually short into each other um, and then it's going to be a case of working out which ones of those need patching as well so there's going to be more than just one or two wires there's going to be I don't know nine or ten at least probably so it's hard to get the angle just right here but you can see these ones here are okay and then as soon as you get down to here they're all broken uh, that one there looks like it's yeah joined up so we might be all right so there's going to be five or six there I think that are needing a wire. So that's it on the top side. We've got a couple of connections there to 68K, one there, and then down here, um, pin four, pin three, pin two, pin one, pin 68, all on the 68K. Uh, and then down here, there's a pad missing, and it, it went down to, uh, sorry, it went up to uh, the, the trace that goes under here, which joins up to these two pins here. So all three of those uh, are joined up. It's gonna be like the program pin, the VCC and the uh, uh, not connected pin perhaps. So with the underside I don't think I need to draw anything on a diagram because I'm going to be able to see this all the while I'm working on it. Now there's something to note here where you've got pads missing like there's three missing there or certainly those two are missing. The solder's not going to flow through to the other side that's why I'm going to use turn pin so that when I see this here I can then flip the board over and just add a bit of solder and flux to the underside uh, you know the top side of the board and flow it from the top side um, just make sure there's no connection supposed to be going to these pads as well on this side but we can see that side so we're ready to stick the socket on actually so I've pushed the socket on there, we'll solder it on now but can you see this is precisely what we need because we can get under there to solder little wires uh, and join up um, and inspect and just make sure the solder is flowed on this side because uh, where there's a pad missing on the bottom underneath the solder's not going to flow through so yeah we'll uh, make sure that's firmly on there and solder that in place. So I've soldered those already. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I've just added some flux and I'm just going to go over uh, each of these uh, with the flux actually because it'll just help with uh, connections to the other side and it'll round off the solder points there because some of them have got had sharp bits sticking out and things like that. Trying to get that flux to come down here. Yeah, it's not too bad on that side. Just give this side a go. And you can see there that little SMD cap, it's supposed to be joined there to that. Uh, first pin. So I've just lightly cleaned up around there, you can see that's not looking too bad as is, uh, obviously I'll get the toothbrush on later. So what we'll do now is we'll flip it over and uh, start to inspect on both sides there 
to see what's flowed and what hasn't flowed actually. And straight away I can see the uh, first couple of pins here, first three pins where the pads are missing on the other side. It's not making a, a great connection. So this is where a super fine tip uh, iron would uh, help. But what we can do is, in fact we'll just get some flux in there. Get some flux there and just heat those uh, pins from this side with a bit of uh, solder. So that's our socket on there. Uh, and I have, uh, like I say, flowed from this top side here where there's a pad missing on this side. That's the only scenario where you need to do that really. So all we need to do now is, uh, is deal with these uh, bits of damage. I've got some offcuts here of uh, Kainar wire. It's quite fine stuff uh, of different colours, different lengths. So I'll use the longest bits obviously to start with for the, the, the longest traces. Uh, I'll start with that small one there because it's super small. And all I'm going to do is uh, add a bit of flux and solder. Join you know, to the relevant pin on this side here and uh, just route the wire around to the relevant place on the CPU. So the first one I'm doing is pin 45, so I've got a bit of flux down here. Just clean the uh, iron, and um, we'll just uh, heat this just to get rid of the flux, there we go. Uh, so 44 is marked on the board here, 45, 46, 47, so it's the fourth one up. Uh, I just need to uh, add a little bit of solder, not much. 44, 45, 46, 47, uh, yeah, add a little bit of solder to that point, there we go, I've done it. Uh, and then introduce my Kainar, uh, so I'll just get it in there, and this is the hard bit. I really could do with uh, a magnifier or a microscope or something so that I can see what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I'm going to end up bridging pins here if I'm not careful. Yeah, that should be all right. And then I just need to inspect it. Just make sure I'm not bridging pins on the 68K. That's what you don't want to do. Yeah, that looks good, actually. So I can just now carefully uh, route that. And the way I'm going to do that is to keep it straight at that point there, like that. And I can put some hot glue on these afterwards, but it just needs to go across here to like the six pin along. So I'll just I'll just do that. Well, this is a work in progress. Um, got bits of hairs and all sorts on here, and loads of flux. I'm not leaving it like that. I'm going to get some more of this canar because these are just off cuts I had, and I've just really quickly. Well, I'll say quickly. It's taken the best part of about two and a half hours actually. Um, it's tracing the connections and things from the. Uh, chip here to this uh, CPU, you know, from the ROM to CPU. Uh, so I will clean it up considerably before I show you the end of this, but uh, we'll power it up now and see what's happening. Oh yes, fantastic. So we've got legit error now. So yeah, W RAM, so it's the main work RAM. Um, actual 8000 expected, zero, 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 zero. So I think uh, that's going to be the upper uh, yeah, the upper. So the upper work ramp would appear to have failed. So I need some uh, 6225 chips for this one. And something interesting to show you here, if you hold down A, B, C, D to go into the individual test menu here, if you test anything, it'll just loop back round again and say the V ramp, the W ram is dead. Obviously you need that work ramp um, to test the system. I mean, it may well be the backup ram's okay, but uh, the system is not capable of uh, using that in the diagnostics ROM here instead of the work ROM. Uh, in theory, I mean, if, while I'm waiting for the chips, what I could do is I could swap one of the BRAMs around, but we might have a BRAM failure later anyway, so that's probably not a good idea. Better off waiting for some working 62256 chips to stick on there, I think. I could redo these uh, me and measure the wires exact, you know, and either wrap them around here rather than going over the top. Um, and get slightly better joins and things, but as you can see, you know, we've got uh, a good connection to the pins. Uh, there's two there, uh, and then this side, these are all coming from the top. One, two, three, four, five, I think, there. So yeah, it certainly could be cleaner, but bear in mind, it's not even got an SM1 list. This board is not going to be a fully functioning board, it's not, I'm going to sell it. Um, but at least I know now uh, it's just the W RAM. So I'll wait for the W RAMs to arrive. We'll swap those out anyway just to get this up and running. Um, and then I'll have a think whether there's anything we can do with this actually um, in terms of uh, an EEPROM uh, service mounted. So I might as well clean up some areas of the PCB light here. You can see where the battery 
has been uh, there's some marks around there it's pretty dirty flux and stuff from when the battery was removed uh, and I'll just inspect around um, I have removed the odd blob of solder that's uh, I don't know how it's got there you know from strange places and stuff uh, obviously nothing to do with the fault uh, I think the initial fault with this has always been the uh, W RAM so my 62256 uh, RAM has arrived uh, ignore that that's socketed as part of another repair actually just to rule it out or to swap that over so uh, nothing really to see there other than the fact that's now got a socket um, yeah, so I think this is uh, Liontech uh, 62256. It might be Dash 70, yeah, it is Dash 70s. Um, so the upper work ram is where we think the fault is here. Uh, I'll just get rid of the hair off there, there's a few hairs on that. Uh, yeah, so the upper work ram, uh, I'm not sure, it might be this one. But what I was going to say is I've looked at the 68,000 pin out here, pin 54 I think is the uppermost data bit. So I'm just going to test on connectivity to work out which one of these two work RAMs here uh, is connected on that uppermost address bit. And we'll target that chip. Um, just I'll show you, we'll just get the hot air there, remove the chip, swap it over and fingers crossed. Now we could have a problem with the select, I haven't probed anything around there, maybe uh, you know we've got a problem with uh, write enable or the chip select or something, but I suspect not, I suspect it's just going to be the SRAM but you never know, uh, it's quicker for me to just swap it over rather than try and mess around trying to work out uh, what's going on. Uh, although perhaps it would only take a minute to check it, but anyway we'll swap it out, I'm sure that's probably what it's going to be. Well, there are quite a few complications on this revision aboard, actually, because you've not got C1, you've got uh, some more of the chips within the C1 exploded out, if you like, these 244s, for example, and some HC32s over here. I think these might be for, like, the chip selects, right enables, I'm not sure, because I did see some connectivity there. Anyway, I've tested these with Logic Probe. They seem okay. Uh, you know, I, can, I don't see any stuck lows or stuck highs when, you know, there shouldn't be. Um... But then I thought, well, let's try and work out which one of these is the upper and which one's the lower, because it's the upper I'm focusing on at the moment. There's no direct connection between the data connections on the CPU here and these, which is a pain, seriously a pain. Obviously, we've got connectivity to the CPU here, otherwise it wouldn't be booting the ROM. But then I thought, well, we should have a connection between that third pin there, you know, the uppermost uh, data bit. Did I say address bit? Data bits we're talking about here. Uppermost data bit. Um, Q15 or D15 um, and I thought it must be going to one of these buffer chips over here and lo and behold it is which is uh, unfortunate because it could mean we've got a faulty chip here now we could if we've got a fault there we could piggyback it with a 74LS244 you know I'd have to cut some pins off of stuff and attach it on there connect up the uh, control signals and stuff and reroute the uh, input through it uh, you know through the chip on top to uh, I think that should be alright, as long as I've got the right speed, it should be okay. But if that's that is if that's the fault. So it the short from that uppermost data bit on the ROM there goes to the fourth pin uh from on here. So if you count four from the left there, it goes there. And I followed it down to this little via. I put you probably can't see it, I put a little red mark there. Let me zoom you in a little bit. Yeah, you can just about see that. We've got a little red mark there with that via. Uh, connects to that fourth pin so that's where it goes and I'm guessing there'll be an output there to somewhere else on the other side of this because if I remember rightly the way these work is you have like inputs you know connections on one side and then connections on the other and it literally uh, I think joins them up depending on the, the select signals um, and that pin then goes all the way down here to another 244 you know another neobuff or the 245s I forget uh, and then it goes down here to uh, the third pin uh, there into this chip uh, now as I say memory serves it passes through and I think the pin on the other side I'll check the pin out of that in a minute just to be double sure but the pin on the other side goes through to here um, goes through to here uh, so it may well be uh, it doesn't just pass straight through there might be a, a difference there so I need to look up the pin out of the Neo buff next just to double check we know this connection is the upper data line, so I just need to double check the pin out to make sure that it's passing through on this side here. It might be uh, lower down or something, just to work out which of these two chips, but at the moment I suspect this one. Yeah, I'm learning all the while on this one. With the Neo C1, 
normally that reads the imports and buffers them with that impedance. And I think these normally belong inside the Neo C1. And there's perhaps one here for buffering something else up here, just looking at where some of the traces go, comes out to the main uh, uh, board here. So I'm guessing that that's functionality from within the C1 by the looks of things. And I'd overlook the obvious, I was trying to trace from the uh, third pin here, which is the uppermost data bit, uh, and I was not getting connectivity, and that was making me think that it went through here. What I should have done is if I go down to the next pin, uh, this is the second uh, most upper data bit, um, we uh, trace along here to the fourth one from the inner there, so one, two, three, four, we've got a short. So, that's right, that's connected to the second most upper data bit there. So this is the upper chip, uh, let's get that short again. And if I move the probe uh, up here on the ROM, uh, up one to pin three, that is the uppermost data bit, and it should be the next one up on here. And it isn't, we're getting a little bit of resistance maybe, but nothing. So we just need a wire from pin three here to the fifth from uh, here. One, two, three, four, five. So, uh, I'll see if there's a wire underneath somewhere that I can attach that to. We may well get past that and then find we've got another problem. Maybe a backup RAM problem, maybe a problem with the graphics side of things, maybe it's uh, still game over with this, I've got no idea. But we'll patch that up and see what difference that makes. And if you think about it, that makes sense, you know, the upper uh, data bit there, that's why we gain 8-0, um, I think, instead of 0-0. So I traced it to the uh, right hand side via there, you can see I just put a red mark, I'll clean these little marks off when I've finished, and it just goes over here to the ROM, and you're probably not going to be able to see, it's just there, the trace is broken from the pad, that was one that I must have missed, it looks like it's joined but it's not, so I just need to just extend that with a tiny piece of K&R I think, that's all I'm going to do. Um, yeah, it's better than running along a wire along there, I can just literally just fix that, because they are really close to each other. Well, would you believe it, all tests passed. So I'm glad they didn't uh, start replacing that SRAM. It's ironic, I've been waiting a week and a half or something or two weeks for that SRAM to arrive. Um, but it was only really just, you know, me thinking things through, let's just follow things and just check some of the obvious things before we start going down the road of replacing it. So I'm glad I did that. Um, so the question is, what's actually wrong with this board then? I mean, other than the fact that someone, you know, wrenched the original ROM off. And incidentally, uh, I've got a correction from the beginning of this video where I said, that, you know, some of the, all the MVS boards are socketed, these ones with the, the dip chip. Uh, these ones aren't, this particular one, this revision. It would have been soldered on there. So that's why it's uh, been, well, that's not why it's been levered off. It's been levered off because a mop has got to it. But uh, yeah, it would have had a mask ROM fitted, soldered directly on there, no socket. Um, maybe there was never anything wrong with it, maybe someone just uh, decided that uh, it would be a good sacrifice to fix something better, maybe a bigger board, a four slot or something, or a two slot. Uh, anyway, we'll test a, a game out, let's just see what's happening. Selected start, yeah, Z80 slot switch ignored. We've got the same problem we had. Yeah, we've got a sound fault on this board, just like on the other one. So, mm, now bear in mind, I've swapped the ROMs over, this has got the faulty S, uh, SM1. Now, my understanding is the SM1 is not absolutely required. If I removed it, we may find it actually works. You don't actually think. Uh, you don't actually need the SM1. It is only used by the BIOS, the normal BIOS, to test the Z80 when you boot the system up. So, I might remove it. I mean, it's saying Z80 dead com issue again though, we're getting different responses. Maybe this has got the same fault with the uh, other the other one as you've not seen yet, the other video. Um, interesting. Yeah, I mean it could just be the Z80, but we're getting the same thing again as well, YM2610 unexpected IRQ. It's almost identical which makes me think this is a common fault on this particular board actually because I've seen the same thing on two different boards here. See if we're getting sound. Well that is interesting. I can't help but wonder 
if the fault is the SM1. I would suggest that's working. Very interesting. No, we do. We do get a Z80 error there. So, hmm, let's leave them with a few questions, this. I know you've not, you see, the thing is, you've not seen the next video yet. You've not seen the one what I'm looking at. This is primarily got a sound issue, and it's, it's the same board as this. It's a subtle different revision, but it's pretty much the same thing. It's got the same chip, same layout. I think the only difference is the uh, BIOS is uh, socketed rather than being soldered on. So, yeah, I'm thinking the SM1 is the issue actually. Now for a move obviously it's not going to pass the diagnostics but the fact it's working leads me to believe the Z80 is okay, the Z80 RAM is okay and the YM2610 is okay. It sounds totally normal to me. Yeah just listen to this, it sounds normal. I mean, aside from the fact it's come through an awful speaker. And just for consistency, testing with an official ROM, you know, the official BIOS SP2, you can see we do get a Z80 error. Now we know the Z80 is alright, as far as I can see, because all the games we tested, it sounds flawless. So, yeah, it's got to be the uh, SM1. Um, it leaves me with a dilemma of what to do. Now, on the other one, there's a bit more. I don't want to tell you what I've done with the other one, what I'm waiting for. But uh, I think, based on the fact that it could cause more damage, if that SM1, let's say it, it's outputting when it shouldn't be doing, it can interfere. Uh, so whilst it might be working well on this board, it could cause something else to fail. So I'm tempted to remove the SM1 for the moment actually, because it doesn't need it. If this board's using a Unibars, you can just skip past the error and it will work. Uh, maybe we can find a solution to the SM1 ROM because, as I mentioned earlier, you can't get uh, an EEPROM, or, you know, equivalent of the same sort of size or an EEPROM. Um, there's nothing in that profile there. So I've got some Captain Tape uh, top and bottom there just to protect it. We can always replace this chip, you know, fit it back on there later or put a replacement on if it's faulty. But I thought we'll just test with the SMT, uh, SMK Dan Diag BIOS and the M1 Diag uh, and see what's happening because I'm hoping we see a slightly different you know, error there. We might get a problem with the SM1 but we may see uh, a difference in the Z80 side of things. It might go, oh, Z80 is alright, you've just got a problem with the SM1. Because we saw that unexpected IRQ from the YM2610 there and that's exactly what was happening with this ROM on its original board. Uh, as you saw at the start of the video, this, this board uh, didn't have the ROM on there because I swapped it over to the other one. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, it didn't make much difference on the other board, as you'll see in the next video, but we did make some progress, certainly for a period of time at least. So this might not be the underlying cause, it could be something to do with the way this ROM is selected. Um, I'm not ruling that out at this stage. Come on, it's free but then it's just moved and soldered itself back on a bit, there we go, that should be okay I think. So this is an interesting discovery, just watch this, this is without an SM1 with uh, Metal Slug 5 in there, but the first time I booted it was okay, just watch this error, M1 ROM error. Now, we've got sound, it's really strange. So it would appear it's something to do with the M1 selection. And I suspect whatever's on, wrong on this board now is the same fault on the other board. 
that might be why these MV1As and 1VAXs uh, just get uh, junked. See, we got it there, then when I pressed the select button, we got no sound. But then, at some point, it reinitialises itself, I think. It's not doing now. So I'm having a seriously hard time trying to understand this fault, actually. Because, as you can hear, the sound is fine. But watch what happens if I switch it off. Uh, in fact, if I just do a soft reset, that'll do it. Just watch. You get this M1 slot error. Something on the car itself is actually doing a check on certain games. See that? And then we're probably lacking sound. Do you hear that? No sound. But if we switch it off and on and go back round. Now I'm using the 161 and 1 here just to test this. But they get the same thing with loads of other carts as well. Official carts and things. Um, it's really strange. But like the first time you go in. You're okay. You know. Uh, let's load. Let's load Matron Mali again. So we'll probably get that error. Maybe. No we haven't. So the sound's okay. I don't understand. Don't understand what's going on. It's like something's latching, uh, and then it's not after a reset. I mean, I would suspect that if there was a problem accessing the M1 ROM, we would hear it within games. It's not. Maybe it's gonna. I don't know how the banking works on the M1 in terms of it switching to the different blocks there. But on a game like this, it's got tons of sound. I would imagine we would hear it pretty quick if there was a fault. See, I had to switch this game off and on three or four times to get it to get sound. But then when it's here, it stays and it's fine. It's very mysterious. I don't like problems like this where it's, you've got an intermittent behaviour. So one of the problems with this is you can't probe uh, the pins and things here. Oh, I'm trying to probe the D0 um, whilst you boot a car. Because as soon as you've got a car in there, I mean it's on at the moment, but as soon as you've got a car in there, it masks it. That's the problem. Um, you, know, you, can, you can spend quite some time tracing the via to the, you know the connections on the D0 or Z80 to the underside of the board, any via points and things. But it takes so long trying to do that for each via; it's darn near impossible. So, yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking the issue we've got is it's intermittent. You know, you can switch it off and on, and you, you may or may not get sound. Uh, and when it's there, it's fine, it's perfect, it's no issues at all, you can play the game for hours, no issues at all. Switch it off and on, you might not get sound. Switch it off and on, you might get sound again. Um, it's very odd, and it's something to do with the uh, M1 um, connectivity, uh, you know, from the board, driving the M1 chip on the car there. And I just don't understand what it is, I think the other board has got the same issue. So I'm inclined to think it's not just a connection. I've really thoroughly inspected the underside and the top side of the board and the cart uh, slot here, the cart slot's been cleaned. But the fact the other one's got the same problem leads me to believe there's something else going on here. Uh, so there's a couple of thoughts. The, the issue we saw a minute ago, that error that was coming up in certain games, that's a protection mechanism that's been built into those. And what it does is it times the response from the Z80 on a 01 command. Uh, and I think it might be something like 7 FFF uh, uh, cycles, you know, a loop. A loop of 7 FFF iterations, I think. And if it doesn't respond within a, the right period of time, it then comes up with that error. So. The error I'm getting is almost going, hang on a minute, you've got a fake MVS here, this is not a genuine MVS, um, based on the timing response from the Z80, on those particular games, but then you switch it off and on, then it'll be alright. So, you know, we could have a problem with the D0, we could have a problem elsewhere that I'm overlooking, the Z80, mm, would it do that? Maybe the Z80s on these two MV1A and 1V, uh, 1VAX boards, 
have a bit of a, an issue. Um, maybe they're not always responding as quick as they should do or something. Occasionally freezing or something like that on boot. I don't know. I'm absolutely in the dark with this one. So, I mean, I do have some Z80s on order. I've got some YM2610s on order. This was not supposed to be a sound repair video. This was supposed to be predominantly focusing on the, uh, you know, the ROM issue there. So it may well be that that's why someone's levered the ROM off there just to reuse the ROM somewhere else, knowing that this has got one of these mysterious sound issues. So there will be a follow-up video. I'll tidy up the wires. As I say, I just use some uh, cut-offs, you know, odd end, odds and ends of wires here. So I've ordered some uh, new cane art, and we'll have a go at uh, just uh, laying them super tidy there just the right distance, uh, you know it could be that, and that could have some relevance there to the sound issue, but I don't think so. I mean, the back end of this video I've been testing without an SM1, um, and that's what you see, you get, you know, it's like intermittent. When you get sound, uh, when you boot it, if you reset it, then you've lost the sound. But when you do get the sound, the sound's totally reliable. Uh, there are a few things that I've not covered on this video to do with these NeoBuff chips. Um, you'll see that in the next video, so that's going back to the original MV1A board uh, that you saw in the previous video. We get that up and running 100%. Uh, now, sadly, the fault that was with that one doesn't seem to be the case with this one. Um, and it doesn't seem to be related to the SM1 missing. It could be. Maybe if I had a decent SM1 there, we'd have the sound every single time. I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, the main purpose of this video is to just get this board up and running, which we've done. Uh, there are no other problems with this uh, board. It was a good job I didn't just jump in and swap the uh, the work ram around here. It was just a consequence of trying to follow the upper uh, data bit that I managed to work out that uh, you know the connection was missing there, and it was just another something I'd overlooked on the ROM. Something I'll point out as well, when we first looked at this board a couple of videos back actually when I just briefly showed uh, one of these boards, I think it was the MV1A I showed, and I was counting the RAMs, I was going around the RAMs going those are VRAMs, these are VRAMs, hang on a minute, we're two VRAMs short, what's going on there? Uh, and I had a look when I was looking at the pinouts of these chips here, Vertec is quite clearly uh, pointed out, I think it's on the GRC, this one here combines the LSPC and the uh, B0, but you've also got the uh, 2K VRAMs within there. So I don't, I'm not sure whether I like that, I don't know, they seem pretty reliable, but when the, you've got the individual, uh, you know, the ones that are sort of that size, but those are pals, they're sort of that size, you know, the eight one, uh, five eight one fours, uh, Sony ones, those fail for fun. So I can't help but wonder if, they've, uh, you know, if these uh, GRC chips fail in that same way. Um, please post in the comments down below, have you had a GRC fail with that, you know, uh, the lower VRAM or whatever it is, or is it upper VRAM, I forget, the 2K ones. Um, yeah, so that's why you've only got the four instead of six chips. Vertec did also send me um, the silicon, actually, he's decapped. I had one of these decapped, or a number of them decapped, and he sent me the piece of silicon. I'll show you that in the next video. Uh, and thanks to Vertec in general for the pinouts and stuff on the Neo Geo developer uh, wiki there. I'll post a link to that down below. It's a super useful website, and without the pinouts and some of the information that Vertec has put on there from reverse engineering various things, uh, these would be a lot harder to work on, but uh, gradually I've made some progress working through these uh, MV1A boards, as you'll see in the next video. made some good progress uh, around this area here, understanding uh, what's going on with uh, the problem on that uh, other MV1A. Anyway, please like, share and subscribe. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.